So we've seen uh, this process of lymphocyte uh, development and maturation and how you have your uh, mature lymphocytes floating around in circulation and embedded in different things like lymph nodes um, where they're going to be reaching out with their receptors to grab onto things. Our uh, T cells include both the cytotoxic ones that are directly going to destroy um, infected or cancerous cells that have something different that's being displayed on the surface. Now you've got your helper T cells that are out there that are being activated by um, binding with their T cell receptor to epitopes that are displayed also. But instead of killing the cells, that's going to result in the release of uh, various cytokines to boost both your white blood cells and also your humoral immunities with the antibodies that are being produced from the plasma cells that came from your B lymphocyte that was activated there. And in this final part, what we want to take a look at is what's going on with these B lymphocytes and these plasma cells um, that are producing these antibodies here. And so it's important to remember that when we're looking at this, our B cell has this B cell receptor. And effectively, an antibody is a secreted B cell receptor that's coming out of there. And if we look at this process here, and we take a look at the structure of our antibody that is out there, um, we saw this a little bit before with our B cell receptor. Um, it's made up of four polypeptide chains right here. Two of them are referred to as heavy chains because they're um, bigger proteins. And then two of the chains are known as light chains because they are smaller. And these are held together with these um, covalent bonds, this um, sulfur disulfide bridge that is forming there, um, holding all these chains together. And if you look at this, um, the antigen binding site is actually formed partly from a light chain and partly from a heavy chain there. And we get these sort of two regions to our antibody molecule right here. This top portion with your antigen binding sites right there forms what's known as the FAB region. And this is where you have those variable regions that are forming those um, antigen binding sites. And remember, there's two of them. So this has effectively got two hands. Only both hands are actually made to um, bind to the same target that is out there. And then you've got this region down here that's termed the FC region because uh, actually if you expose these things to certain kinds of fruit juices that have enzymes like pineapple um, and papaya, they will actually chop up the antibody. And what people found is when they mixed in these um, chemicals with their antibody solutions, it chopped off this FAB region right here and made a little cut and the FC region would actually crystallize and so that's where we get this um, fragment crystallization or FC region right there that is basically made up of these two parts of the heavy chain that are um, projecting down in this particular figure right here. And when we take a look at this process, we want to see what happens with these antibodies when they bind and it's really kind of interesting because one of the things that happens is the antibody is going to bind to surfaces of different kinds of foreign molecules or antigens that are out there and if you think about it, a virus has spike proteins that it uses to attach to your cells well if your antibody um, that came from the original B cell receptor actually binds to these particular spikes that's going to presumably block the virus from being able to attach to your cells. And if they can't attach, they won't be able to go through the whole process of the infection there. Um, when you look at toxins that are out there, antibodies can bind to specific epitopes on the toxin to neutralize it. And over here we can see an example of um, some antibodies binding to the flagella that might be used to attach this pathogen to the sites. So effectively, antibody binding can neutralize uh, these various uh, antigens because it can block their ability to stick to your cells or adhere. Um, the second thing that we can take a look at is demonstrated in this figure over here where um, you have a macrophage that's rampaging along, it's consuming everything, but if an antibody is bound to this foreign antigen right here, that is actually a flag for this uh, macrophage. And the macrophage actually has receptors embedded on the surface that are going to bind to that um, constant region or the FC part of it. And when this pathogen is opsonized, you're going to increase your phagocytosis of that particular particle right there. 
and think about how that plays a role in the other stuff. This macrophage is going to break down this pathogen and it's going to load up epitopes on its MHC2 and display that on the surface to trigger your T cells that are out there. Um, another thing that we can see coming out of this process is when you look at this particular antibody that we'll take a look at in a second, it's actually got multiple antigen binding sites all over the place on this thing because this has actually got multiple antibody molecules that are stuck together here. And this antibody is going to be really used for what's known as agglutination. You're going to aggregate or cross-link all these pathogens and that is going to limit the spread of those particular kinds of pathogens or toxin molecules that might be produced that are out there. And remember, if you think back to the previous chapter with the exo and endotoxins, we can develop anisera against exotoxins because they're protein-based and those are good immunogens, but LPS is slippery because of the lipid portion, so we don't have good anisera against that particular kind of molecule. Um, if we look at another example, uh, antibody binding to these things is going to result in complement activation. If you remember the first step or the first process, the classical pathway that was discovered is antibodies binding to these things trigger the complement cascade. And complement cascade can result in three outcomes. One of them that's depicted here is you form this membrane attack complex with your complement proteins. And this is again similar to what we saw with perforin out there. Only this is less active because you don't have granzyme um, going in and triggering this cell to die. Instead, these cells are dying because of um, osmotic pressure and the ability of ions to go into the cytoplasm, which is going to put excess pressure as they fill up with water um, to make up for the extra salt that is going inside. Um, also, complement activation is going to increase opsonization. If you remember, C3B protein is going to be able to bind to certain peptidoglycan layers, so you increase the ability of complement to increase itself. And also, the third effect of complement activation is inflammation, which is going to result in edema as more fluids get to the area, which is going to bring more complement proteins, it's going to bring more antibodies, it's going to bring more cells, and so you can see how this whole process feeds on itself right here. Um, the other thing that comes out of this is a nice cumbersome name. It's called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. And the name sort of says it all right there. Your antibody binds to the surface of your foreign particle out there, and along comes a natural killer cell right here that has those FC receptors like your um, macrophage did in the previous example there. This thing, when it binds to the constant region of your antibody that is bound to this, it's going to cause this natural killer cell right here to start releasing its cytotoxins, so perforin and granzymes that are out there. Um, we can also see eosinophils doing a similar thing. Um, when they bind, it's going to trigger them to degranulate. And when they degranulate, they are going to release various cytotoxic chemicals over here. And that can include things like superoxides and peroxides. Um, they'll also release various kinds of enzymes like proteases and RNases. Um, to break down RNA viruses that are out there that have been bound by um, this particular antibody. Um, you can even get growth factors and cytokines being released from these things. Um, so it's not just cytotoxic, there are other elements that are kind of come into play. Um, the last thing that we'll take a look at is, um, if you remember from the previous chapter, we've got various portals of entry into your body. Well, one particular antibody isn't going to work in all these different portals of entry, so just like you would see in, um, say, a workshop, you need different tools for different jobs. The same thing here. We need different antibodies for different jobs. And the way that our body does this is we make five different types of what are known as um, immunoglobulins, which is basically just an immune system molecule that is globular in shape. And that's our antibody that's out there. And we can see We've got five different antibodies that we are producing in varying amounts, and they have different um, 
target regions where they're going to work and different abilities in terms of their function. And these are known as isotypes. And so if you think about this, the B cell receptor is on the surface of your B cell. It binds to an antigen and then it makes a plasma cell. Well, the plasma cells can switch effectively the constant region while keeping the variable region so that all of these antibodies could be produced, but the constant region can vary effectively, but you still have the same B cell receptor variable region for antigen binding that's out there. So these are really going to deal with um, different types of antigens that are out there, the um, portal of entry, and also the function that we need for the antibody. And if we look at the most prominent one that is out there, is known as IgG, and you can see it's about 80% of total antibody in your serum there. It's got our two antigen binding sites, and this thing is basically going to be found uh, in your blood plasma and also in your lymph. And you can also find it on the surface of some cells. It's basically going to um, course throughout your body, neutralizing and binding to different things that are out there, agglutinating, activating complement, all of that stuff that we saw in the previous thing. But it also has one extra thing um, that isn't on this little table here. It can cross the placenta and get into a growing fetus, which means it can trigger the innate defenses inside the fetus before they're even born to attack foreign particles. And in this case, the IgG is coming from mom and crossing the placenta there. Um, when you look at these guys, they are going to be around for months. Their half-life is about 20 days. So uh, you start out day one with 100%. After 20 days, you've got half of it. After 40 days, you've got 25% of the original amount. So IgG is going to be around for a while, but then again, you're probably going to get exposed to that antigen again. Uh, if we look at IgM, this is the macro antibody. It's actually got five of these antibody monomers that are out there. So it's got 10 binding sites around the outside. It is going to be lower in your serum, typically 5 to 10 percent. Um, it's also going to be found in your lymph fluids, and it has a half-life of about 10 days. So it's going to be around less um, in terms of time compared to your IgG. And really the function for this thing is it's going to agglutinate and also neutralize. It can um, activate complement a little bit, but it's really its primary function is that idea of um, limiting the spread of these foreign uh, antigens that are out there. If we look at IgA, this is an interesting molecule. It can be found as a monomer in your serum, but that's not where you're going to find most of it. It's about 13% of your total serum, uh, ranging 10 to 15%. But the dimer form of this, where two antibodies are stuck together and they've got this little secretory component and a J chain that holds them together, this is secreted. And so you're going to find this in um, your mucus, in your intestines, your tears, in breast milk. And this is going to be really useful at neutralizing um, antibody or antigens that are out there so that they can't get in um, if you can neutralize the adhesins. And also it's going to trap them in that mucus. And to a certain extent, it is going to agglutinate, but not as much as something like IgM. Uh, if we look at this little guy here, it's known as IgD. And again, the difference here with the isotype has to do with the heavy chain right here. This has got the delta heavy chain. Um, IgD is unique because um, nobody knows what it does even to this day. You can find it on the surface of B cells. You can find a little bit of it floating around in your um, bloodstream, but nobody really knows why it's being secreted, but it does have a half-life of about three days, so it's not going to be around for very long in your bloodstream there. Um, the last one that we can see is known as IgE. And this one, if you look at this, it's less than 1%. Some people estimate it's 0.002% of antibodies in your blood serum. It's got a half-life of about two days. Um, you can also find it in your um, lymphatic fluids. But the thing that this thing really does is... Um, it's going to bind to um, different kinds of antigens that are out there. Typically, um, we find it with parasitic worm infections. Um, you're going to see an increase in the amount of IgE. And what it does is kind of cool is um, it's actually going to bind onto the surface of um, 
these pathogens and trigger things like eosinophils um, to actually start to release inflammatory and cytotoxin molecules. The other problem is it results in allergies, and that's because it binds to the surface of your cells, your mast cells and your skin, and along comes an allergen, and that triggers this thing to degranulate, and it's going to release um, a whole bunch of these inflammatory molecules.